Welcome to another edition of the Hit the Lights podcast. I have a very special guest with me today. I have Mr. Artisan Electrics. Jordan, how are you doing? Hi, Gary. Yeah, I'm good, thanks. How are you? Yeah, I'm not too bad, thank you. Are you uh, weathering the storm that we're currently in at the moment okay? Just about. Yeah, just about. It's a bit crazy, but I'm managing to keep things ticking over and Actually, bizarrely, I feel like I'm busier than I've ever been, which, but just not with the normal stuff. So, yeah, it does seem to be that way, doesn't it? With um, with quite a lot of people that I, I've interacted with, they're either manic busy or they've got nothing. And I think it's that those people that are fortunate to still have something. Um, it just managing the workflow it just seems to be crazy at the moment. Yeah, and I think as well, just having more time at home because the the phone has pretty much gone dead I've sort of been trying to cram in as much stuff as I can of catching up of stuff at home and I kind of I have got this feeling like oh I've got so much that I need to catch up on at home so I'm just absolutely mad busy whenever I'm at home catching up with loads of stuff so yeah it's not really a restful time (laughs) no in one way I suppose that's good keep busy yeah exactly yeah so if you don't mind, just uh, could you tell us a little bit of how you came to enter the industry and like your journey so far? Yeah, so um, I sort of spent my youth trying to avoid becoming an electrician because my dad was an electrician. And I remember everyone used to always say to me, oh, you're going to be an electrician like your dad. And I used to say, no, I'll never be an electrician. Electrician's a dumb job. I want to do something with computers or be a businessman or something like that you know very naively so I never wanted to be an electrician even though I used to do bits and pieces with my dad when I was on school holidays and stuff like that but I always wanted to do something a bit different so getting to 16 having to decide what to do I just went down the route that everyone else was going which was go to sick form and then, you know, heading on the track to go towards university, basically. Um, so I went to, I managed to get into quite a good sixth form college in Cambridge, actually, the, one of the best sixth form colleges in Cambridge. Uh, barely got in by the skin of my teeth. But I studied business and archaeology, randomly. So I did that, got in there, did that for a year. And during that year, I kind of grew up quite a lot. And I realised that the track that I was going on wasn't really what I wanted out of life. I I could see myself, you know, carrying on at college, then going to university and ending up getting a desk job and not being really happy. Uh, And a a good friend of mine said to me, look at your dad, you know, he's he's an electrician. He's he he enjoys his work. He's able to earn good money and he's always been able to support you and your family well. So why don't you just ask your dad if you can do an apprenticeship with him? Um, so I I did. I, I ate humble pie and I went to my dad and I said, hey, how about you give me an apprenticeship? And he very kindly did so. And I quit college halfway through. Everyone thought I was crazy because they thought I was throwing away, a, you know, opportunities to go to university and all that stuff. But I did it and um, best one of the best decisions I've ever made, really. So, yeah, I, I started my apprenticeship with my dad and um, did that, did all my exams and all that stuff, got qualified. And just after I got qualified, unfortunately, my dad got diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and three weeks later he was dead. Wow, that's uh that's incredible isn't it really um yeah it was pretty intense I can yeah, tell you that. yeah no yeah no I'm sorry to hear that did um so let, let's let's maybe focus on slightly on on the positive thing you obviously approached your dad to to work with him uh, what what was it like working with uh, a close family member yeah it was great actually I think for him it was probably quite frustrating at times just like it must be for any uh, anyone who has an apprentice trying to teach someone something from scratch. You've got to have a lot of patience. And he was very, very patient. So he did. He was 
he taught me very well um and we got on great so we enjoyed working together and I learned lots from him he you know he he um taught me as much as he possibly could really which is great so and we had we had some great projects because he had this really interesting contract well it wasn't really a contract it was just sort of an agreement he did all the work for English heritage for the okay. whole Anglia basically so we got to we did work in amazing uh, properties you know these beautiful old stately homes um and one of the main places we used to do a lot of work at was Audley End House in Saffron Walden, which is a big, big stately home sort of mansion place. We did all the maintenance and stuff there mm-hmm. and projects and things. So we got to work in these amazing buildings, work with some amazing systems, you know, like a lot of it was in pyro and stuff like that. So I got to do a bit of pyro work, which was interesting, and got to go in all the rooms where nobody was allowed to go with all these very expensive paintings that were sort of all stashed away for preservation and things like that. Got to crawl around in in the loft of hundreds of years old buildings and under mm. in down in the cellars and things like that. So yeah, it was it was very interesting. So there's obviously quite a few listed buildings and and things like that. Was there anything in particular that you learned about what the do's and do nots about listed buildings during that time? Yeah. (laughs) Um, Yeah. The walls are very thick and be careful where you drill. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, We used to have these really long drill bits, which I still have actually, and I still use them from time to time. But obviously you have to be very careful when working and listing buildings to not damage anything that has, you know, historical value. So we used to have to get permits to work and stuff like that for certain areas where we had to be super careful. Um, And they had quite strict kind of guidelines about things so that we made sure that we didn't do any irreversible damage to these beautiful properties. Yeah, it wouldn't be cheap to put it right, would it? (laughs) No, exactly. Yeah. So obviously, up up to that point, you, did you say you managed to get qualified whilst working for your dad? Yeah, I did. Yeah. So I was 21. I got, I did my AM2, got got qualified, and then, like I said, unfortunately, he died. So I was su- suddenly in a situation where, well, he was terminally ill. So he knew, you know, we knew that he didn't have long to go, and it it, it went very very quick. Um, so it was a case of like he was on his deathbed and he was saying trying to teach me how to do invoices <laughs> and oh. sort of run through all the stuff because he basically realized that I was going to have to take over the family business you know yeah so it was um, re- a really steep learning curve and yeah 21 my dad died he was only 48 and then I found myself basically having to pick up the pieces and try and keep this business going, which mm. was quite intense, really. Yeah. So is that the artisan as we know it? No, it's not. No. So it's uh, that was AC Electrics at the time, which was the company that my mum and dad had set up when my dad decided to go self-employed. So it's Andrew and Candice Electrics or AC as in, you know, alternating current. Obviously, it mm. fit quite well both ways. Um, and yeah, that was the business that he'd he'd run for quite a long time. So I ran that business for a few years, and it, it went fine. I, I took things over and I kept running it, and and um, everything went well. But at a certain point, I I got married, and my wife and I we decided that we wanted to do some volunteer work and travel. So we sold the business, and we went went volunteering went traveling for a few years and then i came back and started artisan electrics doing that and traveling so you say you traveled for was it a year sorry um it was sort of on and off for about three years actually for three years okay so did you find you had to set up a completely from scratch again when you returned yeah so i sold the previous business to a guy who had been doing some kind of subcontracting for me and stuff um, who was looking to branch out a little bit so I sold that business to him and then when I came back I just started from scratch so but it was good because I could I could take all the lessons from my dad's business and things 
you know when you take over an existing business there's always things that you kind of have to do because that's the way it's always been done and it's very difficult to change whereas if you're starting from scratch you can start a business in a much more efficient way having learned from all the mistakes of of the previous business shall we say so uh, I I found it a really good experience actually starting Artisan Electrics with having learned all those lessons previously from from AC Electrics. Yeah and I can empathize with that I ended up taking over a a 47 year old business and even in the short duration that I was uh, MD uh, you know you you like you say you take away so many lessons learned and things that you do wrong and you learn more from your failures that you can take forward um which yeah i think anyone if there is a positive from a failure take it as a lesson being learned oh yeah definitely how did you end up developing into the artisan that we know today in terms of like your youtube channel etc um it's a really good question i still sort of ask myself that sometimes because it was never there was never a sort of a conscience conscious moment where I decided I want to become a YouTuber or something like that it was literally I set up Artisan Electrics in 2016 and you know you're starting a business from scratch so naturally you, you pick a name and then you set up all your social media accounts so I set up my Twitter account my Instagram account and I also just set up a YouTube channel for the business um And I didn't really post much on it. I think I remember the first video I ever posted was about a 10 second video of a emergency light that got full of water. And I just opened the cover and all the light, all the water poured out. (laughs) Mm. And I just stuck that on. And then I think I did a consumer unit change one day and I just did a time lapse of it and stuck that on there. And then I did a video, uh, just a very brief sort of tutorial video about 30 seconds or something of how to reset the thermostat in an immersion heater because I found that loads of customers would call me and say my immersion heater is not working and I'd go out to them and I would literally take the cover off the immersion heater press the button to reset you know reset the the thermal cutout and it it would work and I thought oh maybe I should just put a video about this and it'll save loads of people having to pay to call out an electrician Mm. (laughs) so I did yeah, just little bits and pieces like that. And then one day the the videos just started to get quite a lot of views, especially that um, immersion heater one. I think that's had like 80,000 views or something now. Mm. Um, Do you find that's a little bit like anti-entrepreneurial almost? <laughs> <laughs> With yeah, one? I suppose, um, you know, in a way it is because you're obviously, you know, if people can fix it themselves and they're not going to pay you to do it but I kind of figure that like little simple things like that if you can save someone a little bit of money then it it will come back to you in the long run somehow because people will see that you're not just out there to kind of get a quick buck but you're out there to try and genuinely help people and um, you know provide a good service so I've never found that anything that I've put on YouTube has actually um, reduced the amount of business that I get if anything it's increased the amount of business I get yeah, no, yeah, definitely It'll build up trust, won't it, with your with your clients, as you say. So, have you have you started to utilise YouTube slightly more in a in a sense of advertising then, uh, advertising yourself and your company? Again, sort of not purposefully, but indirectly, I do get quite a bit of work out of it now, which um, which yeah, it's a nice it's a nice sort of perk. So, people, for example, who are looking particularly for electric vehicle charging installations. I do have quite a lot of people who come to me because they've seen my videos and they need an electric vehicle charging point installed. So they'll contact me and ask me for a quote. Consumer unit changes as well. I've had a few people contact me for that because of my YouTube videos. So it does, yeah, definitely creates some work. And I have had quite a few decent jobs out of it, actually. What, what's been some of the challenges that YouTube has provided, not only yourself, but I suppose your business as well? I would say not. I wouldn't say it's created any challenges for, for my business, but I would say personally, because I have, you know, the channel started to take off and then I did start to post regular videos. And now it's kind of 
it's become a thing where I have to post a video every week and I have to keep the momentum going. You know, I'm just about to hit 10,000 subscribers now. And it's like um, it has become something that I'm, you know, taking very seriously now. Uh, that poses uh, an issue in that it takes a lot of time. So I'm not only running a business, but I'm also trying to post regular YouTube videos, doing lots of editing, um, all that stuff, you know, re replying to comments. Um, so, yeah, it's sort of another thing that you that takes a lot of time, which when you're already busy running a business and doing all the other stuff that life throws at you, it's uh, it's not always easy to actually find the time for it. Yeah. That's why I'm quite happy with this time off at the moment to be able to throw out a few more videos and just catch up on editing and stuff. Actually, it's been quite good. I've been able to sort of double my YouTube output over the last few weeks. In terms of creating different revenue streams from it, then I remember seeing a uh, might have been a little while ago now um, a video where you, you obviously described uh, how you monetize um youtube and, and stuff like that and obviously where i've started doing the podcast i've started seeing it come up in various scenarios so can you maybe give us a little bit of uh, an insight as to how you monetize that for yourself yeah so the main way that you monetize a youtube channel is through advertising revenue so there is um there is a certain criteria that you have to meet for youtube to be able to monetize your videos and and what it means to monetize your videos is, is essentially that youtube will play adverts before and after and sometimes during your video and then you will get i think it's 50 percent of the advertising revenue that they charge to the the advertisers right so in order to um monetize your channel you have to have a thousand subscribers and you have to have, I think it's 4,000 watch hours. So in other words, people have watched for, watched your videos for 4,000 hours. Um, those two criteria have to be met. Then you can apply for monetization. And if they approve your channel, then you can start putting ads on, on your videos. And then you do start to see a bit of money crawling in. It is not a lot, to be honest. So the average what they call CPM, which is cost per meal, or which means cost per thousand views, basically, um, is about five, six pounds per thousand views. Right, okay. So, you know, a video with 10,000 views, you might get 50 or 60 quid in ad revenue for it. So it's not, you know, massive, but it certainly helps. And it obviously builds up over time because the the more momentum your channel gets, the more views your videos get, the more you start to see income. And also what's interesting about it is there's a kind of a passive income, which is possible because you can make videos that will be watched, not just in the first week, but they will continue to be watched over the months and years uh, that follow. So, for example, I've got a video that um, has had over 100,000 views now. And that's earned me like 300 quid so far for that mm. one video just in ad revenue. So that's the first um, kind of st income stream, I would say, from YouTube. But it's not the only one and it's probably not the best one. Uh, the other thing is I do is affiliate links. So Amazon have an affiliate program where if you share links to their products and people buy them then you get a kind of commission of about seven or eight percent on anything that people buy and what i usually do in my videos i'm always talking or mentioning tools that i'm using on the job and i'll put links in the video description to the various tools that i use and then sometimes people buy those tools and i get a, a little bit of commission on that as well mm. oh, no no so it's an, it's an intelligent way just to add that little bit extra to your not only your videos but obviously for the the end customer as well yeah exactly yeah and people are often how i started that really was people would ask me like oh what was that um you know what was that screwdriver that you were using or what um what do you use for this what do you use for that and so i, I would end up sharing the links with them and i thought oh i might as well actually monetize it if they're going to buy it anyway then you might as well get a bit of, of income out of it yourself so mm. um, yeah 
Yeah, no, that makes sense. Predominantly, you obviously mentioned in the past you've done English heritage and stuff like that. Is that developed in, into your your current um, installation work? Are you still kind of completing that, or have you ended up uh, going into the domestic market? No, so actually that that um, English heritage stuff, what happened at some point, um, probably a, a couple of years after my dad died, I think they they basically contracted it out to a big national contractor. So we lost all that work. Um, and then that was not, that was probably not that long before I sold the business. So we stopped doing that. Um, and I've not, I, because I sold, I sold the previous business. I wasn't able to keep any of my previous clients anyway. So I, I literally had to start from scratch, but it was quite good because I could be more, uh, selective about the kind of people that I take on as customers, if you mm. see what I mean. Yeah. Um, so the whole, my whole target market really, when I started Artisan, the name and everything, I was aiming for sort of high end domestic customers, really people who wanted a really high quality job, um, weren't so much worried about the cost and just people who wanted a top quality customer service. Um, and, and that's what I've been aiming for all along really. And I've got a really good client base now of those type of customers, mostly domestic but some commercial customers as well yeah so when you say like you you've sought the right type of client what were the sort of things uh, you were looking for well in cambridge there's a lot of people who've got big beautiful houses uh where they they're quite particular about how things look and what kind of um you know what kind of installations they have done what kind of people they let into their house so um yeah it's those kind of customers that i was sort of aiming for really and i i've certainly been able to reach quite a few of those now okay that's good have you have you found that's more through just the branding of the company uh yeah so from the start i was intent on getting a lot of good reviews online so i've got like a google my business page for example and um i wanted to get a real good base of good reviews from customers because I know that the kind of people that I'm aiming for are the kind of people who look online and look at people's reviews before they choose who they're going to get to do their work um, so that's one of the things that I concentrated on and that's really helped me to reach the the right kind of people you initially said that you set up on quite a few not social medias but different platforms have you developed any of those alongside the the YouTube element that you've done? So I I do Instagram, but that's not really I don't I get a little bit of work out of Instagram, but not much. Uh, but in terms of platforms for reviews, I basically just created profiles on all the different platforms that allow reviews. Um, so like you know Facebook and google are the main ones but then there's others that i started out on which some people um don't really like but things like rated people and my builder and um, they all have these functions where a customer once they've used you they'll leave a review and the more different platforms you have good reviews on the the higher you tend to appear in search rankings and if people see that you've got lots of five star reviews across loads of different platforms, then it does tend to um, give them a good impression about your business. How would you deal uh, with a, a negative uh, comment or response? Um, depends if it's genuine or not. <laughs> well, yeah, I suppose that is a quite a big issue. Um, if, if fake comments and reviews are, are being posted, is that something you've experienced? No, I haven't, fortunately. So I've been quite... Um, pleased that that hasn't happened so far um but there are you know sometimes you get you will get a bad review i mean i've not had any like one star reviews or anything like that uh but i always aim for five stars so if a customer gives me a four star review then i'll come back to them and say um thanks for your review can you tell me what i could have done to get five stars you know because that's that's the kind of person I am. I'm always looking for 
um, constructive feedback. I'm always trying to improve. I, you know, I'll admit that I'm not perfect and there's always ways to kind of refine and, and improve your service and, and your quality of installation. So um, that's what I just try to do is, is if it's a genuine review, just take it on board, you know, and um, it's good to have some if you've got only five star reviews everywhere anywhere, then people might question whether they're genuine or not, because some people can try and like buy reviews and things like that online. So uh, it's good to always have like the odd four star or three star review, I guess, just thrown in there to, so that people know that it, it is genuine. Yeah. Yeah. Just have a bit of a half a day off or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so w- where do you see yourself and your business going in the years to come? It's a difficult one. I, I've been wrestling with it a little bit because I've sort of hesitated from trying to get too big because I have the feeling that if I expand too much, then my sort of personal level of surf- service and um, the all the things that kind of define my business at the moment are in danger of of going when you when you scale you know it's mm-hmm. different when you scale something to keep it good so like for example there are a few of my competitors in cambridge who are you know kind of large electrical companies and the amount of bad customers like feedback that i hear about them from people who've used them is um it, it's a shame you know and i think probably it's hard to maintain a really high standard of customer service if you've got a big business with loads of guys running around. Um, So what for me, I'm not really ambitious when it comes to artisan electrics. All I want to do is kind of keep it ticking over the way it is. Uh, I I mean, I will keep growing. I've got a couple of subbies who work for me now on a fairly regular basis. Um, So that helps take the pressure off when I've got too much work to handle by myself. Um, And then the biggest thing for me now is really growing the YouTube channel because I'm starting to see how I'm starting to get some sponsorship deals and things like that now for the channel. And that's creating um, more of a viable income that it could actually be something that I could uh, live off. So that's my thing is really to grow the YouTube channel as much as I can to get it to the point where I could live off that. And then, you know, that will help with, life <laughs> yeah yeah the bills um yeah <laughs> so you, you obviously mentioned that, that establishing that brand and maintaining that brand is one of the reasons you don't grow but you did mention that you use uh subcontractors so how, how do you ensure that they meet the requirements of your ethos and brand yeah so i'm very selective about who i take on who works for me so if i for these guys one of them i've been using him for years and i know him quite well um i used him in my previous business and i know his standard of work and i know his um you know he's good good with the customers the other guy is more more new he actually kind of contacted me through twitter and so what i did with him because i needed a bit of an extra hand i just um worked with him for a day and made sure that I was happy with his, you know, his personality and his standard of work and things like that. And then I'll, I'll give some kind of specific training as well about it's mainly about customer service, you know, because I think most qualified electricians will work to a fairly decent standard anyway. I mean, I know that that, that, that can vary quite a lot, but in general, if they've got a fair amount of experience and, and they're qualified, then they should be able to work to a high standard. But the thing for me is customer service because a lot of people they can be good like they can be a great electrician but they can be terrible at dealing with customers because they just don't have that kind of personal um those communication skills and things like that so for me it's as much important that they do a good job electrically um but also that they actually present well to the customers and they deal appropriately with the customers you know respectfully and things like that because as I said before my kind of ethos when it comes to customer service is like five-star customer service as well 
Yeah. So what's one of the main things you enjoy about the electrical industry? I love the challenges. I love the fact that there's you're never in one place for too long. Certainly in my line of work anyway, being domestic, it's usually, you know, the longest you'll be in one place is maybe doing a rewire or something and you'll be there for a couple of weeks. But in general, it's um, it's varied, you know. So like today I was working this beautiful oak barn that my customers built working out in the countryside in the middle of nowhere and I was wiring up this barn in steel wire armoured because he wanted all the cabling done in steel wire armoured um, so it was a so really he, sounds re- slightly unusual but yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's, he's one of those customers who's just really particular and he likes things done a certain way and he doesn't I said to him it's going to be a lot more labor intensive if you if I do it this way but he he doesn't care he just he's got an idea in his head and that's what he wants and that's what we do so it's um yeah it's always it's always interesting there's never a dull day really uh and I like the fact that you're always learning you know it's not like you do your you know you do your am2 and that's it you're qualified and you don't learn anything more every job is a learning experience because there's always something that challenges you or something that you've not come across before and one of the things I love about YouTube is that actually it's it's put me in touch with a huge audience of other electricians who when they see the way I do something they'll they'll say to me in the comments oh, why didn't you do it this way or oh you could have done it like that or you know and it makes you realize that there's more than one way of doing things that that is the right way sometimes and sometimes there's better ways of doing things not necessarily that your way isn't isn't right but there would actually be a better way or an easier way or a more efficient way of doing things and you can learn from other people through social media which is great so is there anything you you don't enjoy about the electrical industry i would say that one of the things is this whole kind of race to the bottom thing that seems to be going on at the moment which is that sometimes people will be out there and they will be willing to do a job for virtually nothing and cut corners that becomes the kind of expected standard of work from some customers they you know they'll they'll be given a quote that's ridiculously cheap and then when you come in with your price they're kind of like oh you know that's way more expensive than what I've been quoted from someone else but it's often because people are out there and they they are unfortunately willing to cut corners and do things on the cheap which is not something that I'm willing to do so that's that's one unfortunate thing about the industry but I don't think I don't think that'll ever change really unfortunately yeah so how how do you combat that with a customer you know in the instance that say they've been given a a cheaper quote elsewhere do you you literally just say okay fine go with it and if it all goes tits up hope that they'll return or do you uh, like try and substantiate the reasoning behind your costs it really depends on the customer so if i get the feeling that they are just trying to save money and they don't really care about the quality of the installation i'll just i'll just drop it because that's not the kind of customer that i want anyway um so i you know i'll just my feeling is that's fine they can get a cheaper job elsewhere and i'm not bothered about losing that customer but but sometimes there are customers out there who are genuinely looking for a good job and they just feel a bit confused and lost because they see, you know, they they Google, you know, electricians and then they see this whole sea of people out there and then they get three quotes and they're all vastly different. And they just feel a bit kind of lost as to how to choose someone that they know that they're going to get a good result from. So in that case, I will, you know, if they genuinely come back to me and say, look, I'd really like to use you, but your price is quite a lot higher than this other one that I've got. I will explain things to them and, and explain maybe why my price is higher than somebody else's and, and then leave it with them. You know, it's up to them to decide at the end of the day. The, the best way to stick stick to your guns and don't compromise on the cost of your service. Yeah, I don't do haggling or, or discounts or anything like that. 
I think uh, we we've got to we've got to know our value as electricians. It is a very skilled trade, and um, we can't let people sort of diminish that really. Yeah, no, one hundred percent. So, is there anything you'd like to see introduced into the industry? I think training is something that needs to be improved because unfortunately what's happening is there are only a few different ways to come into the industry and the level of training that people are receiving is not necessarily the highest standard and not not to a standard that they are going to be able to actually cope in the real world um i i'm not i i won't say i'm against these like five week courses or whatever because i know that some people that's the only way that they can get into the industry but i feel like people need more than that in order to be able to really you know get into the industry when i think about myself at uh, the, the standard of work that i used to do when i was an apprentice And even after being, you know, even after being qualified, to be honest, sometimes I'll think back to some of the jobs that I've done and I think, man, that was shocking, you know, because I it takes years and years and years to really sort of refine your skills and and get to a point that you can really be proud of of your work and and that you know how to deal with certain challenging situations. And unfortunately, some people are just getting on this kind of um, fast track system and then being thrown out into the electrical world and the quality of work that's being put out there is really substandard and it's it's a problem and it's a danger for for people I mean new builds is a classic example you know the quality of installation in new builds is absolutely shocking I mean not all of them but some some new new house builds because they're they're being pressured on on price um so they're they're having to you know they call it house bashing they're having to knock these houses out super quick to be able to actually cover their costs Uh, and then they're getting in this you know these kind of cheap labor people who may be fairly newly qualified and they're not being supervised properly i'm not against like i i've worked a lot in the past with volunteers and i've trained volunteers on how to do electrical work people who've never done electrical work in their lives but if someone's properly trained and supervised they can do a great job but if they're not properly trained and they're not supervised then that is a recipe for disaster unfortunately Mm. is that something you've potentially considered within your business whether that be an apprentice or even an adult learner yeah i've thought about taking on an apprentice Um, But the problem for me is always that I'm just so busy that I can't afford to slow down enough to take on an apprentice. Mm. (laughs) It's a bit of a catch-22, to be honest, because I know that probably after two years of having an apprentice, it would help me. But it's just uh, I've never been at that point where I can actually um, afford that sort of time to just train someone at the moment. But, But it is something that you know i am thinking about for the future possibly yeah might be able to give you a bit more time on on the channel rather than um having to rush around job to job potentially yeah exactly yeah um so it's been it's been fantastic chatting to you and and listening to you know a a completely different side of of the industry and and your experiences but i I do have one last question Mm -hmm. what's your favorite movie oh Wow, uh, that's a good question. And seeing as you quite like, you know, filming and editing, I'm expecting a, a good one. <laughs> oh man, you put me on the spot. There. <laughs> um, I'm gonna say Shawshank Redemption, and I know that's like a real cliche because that's probably like half of the population's favourite film, but that's the one that first springs to mind. So. Can you tell me why? I just think it's a great sort of combination of. Um, kind of feel good uh, factor but also you know a bit of a thriller and it, yeah it's, it's one it's a film that I can watch more than once which a lot of there's not a lot of films that I can watch more than once 
yeah i always i always hear morgan freeman narrating my life so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah he is a great narrator um, yeah <laughs> yeah so it's uh it's been a pleasure chatting with you uh jordan and uh i'd like to thank everyone for listening